Welcome to Magnificent Mixtures, where we're going to explore lots of different liquids, how we can dissolve substances into liquids, create different densities, and explore hydrophobic liquids to create some magnificent scientific artwork. If you'd like to do some of these experiments at home, here's the equipment you'll need to make your own Magnificent Mixtures. A glass and a couple of cups, some salt, a tablespoon and a teaspoon, some oil, some golden syrup, some food colouring, we've got powdered food colouring, liquid food colouring will be fine, some water coloured paints or you can just water down some poster paints, a paintbrush, some wax crayons, a piece of paper, tray, some shaving foam, some ink, if you've not got ink, watered down poster paints or watercolour paints would be fine, some fizzy water, an effervescent tablet, so we're using denture tablets but you could use vitamin C tablets or Alka-Seltzers, anything that is effervescent and that means it reacts to make a gas. Some raisins and that's not just for when I get hungry, some Epsom salts, or you could use ordinary salt or sugar, and a jug of water. Many substances are a mixture of different chemicals, and a mixture is often in the form of a solution, where one chemical is dissolved in another one. Scientists often want to find out what chemicals are inside of a solution or a mixture. So they try to separate the different chemicals from one another. There are many methods in which they can do this, like filtration or distillation, chromatography or even evaporation. But not all chemicals will mix together. Some just don't get along. Let's explore mixtures and find out how to make a solution. What substances will dissolve, what substances won't, and how this affects their properties such as their density. In this experiment, we're going to make a solution of salt water and see what effect it has on density. I've got two cups of water here, one I've coloured yellow and one I've coloured blue. The blue we're going to keep free of salt, whereas the yellow we're going to add salt to it. So we're going to take some salt, we're going to add two teaspoons and stir it in. As we stir it, the water is allowing the salt to dissolve inside. And this is now a solution. Because there is now salt in the water, there are more molecules in this liquid than there are in the blue liquid. This is going to change the liquid's density. Well, we can see how the density has changed in the two liquids if we do a simple pouring experiment. So I'm going to take my salt water solution and pour it into the bottom of this glass. We're then going to take our water and pour it on top. But instead of pouring it directly over top, where it's likely to mix, we're going to pour it over the back of a spoon. And as we pour the water slowly over the back of the spoon, we're going to notice it travelling down the side of the glass. And as it travels down the side of the glass, we're going to start to build up two separate layers. So here we can see the yellow salt water at the bottom is much more dense than the blue water at the top. Now some mixing has occurred in the middle but we do have a graduated scale of density and this means at the bottom we have the most dense liquid and at the top we have the least dense liquid. 
There are lots of substances in our homes that are liquids, but some can be much more dense than others. So let's take a look how we can stack them in another way. I'm going to take some syrup and pour it into the bottom of our glass. Now our syrup is very viscous and thick and sticky, and that's because it's got lots of sugar dissolved inside. The syrup sat at the bottom of the glass and to it we're going to add a super saturated salty solution. Here I've just got some coloured water again and we're going to add four teaspoons of salt to this instead. One, two, three, four. Now I've used slightly warmer water because warm water allows more of a substance to get dissolved inside. I'm going to keep mixing and adding salt until no more salt can dissolve. Now I've got my super salty solution, I'm going to layer it just as we did before using the back of a spoon. Then we're going to take ordinary water, again just with blue food colouring in to help see it, and layer it on top of the salt water, pouring very slowly over the back of the spoon. Then I'm going to add another liquid, which is even less dense, some oil. So I'm going to take a bit of oil and again pour it on the back of the spoon. Now we can see some very clear layers. Our syrups at the bottom, then we've got our salt water, our ordinary fresh water and oil on the surface. The more chemicals that are inside of the solution, the more dense it is. Things that are most dense will sit at the bottom, whereas things that are least dense will sit on the top. Some liquids are so thick and viscous and have the highest density that they can move really slowly. Now this is an interesting ooze tube, so we can see that air bubbles get trapped inside as the air travels from the bottom through the hole and the liquid's flowing down but it's very slow. This experiment is going to take a look at how density can also affect buoyancy. Here we have a glass of water, again with a bit of food colouring in to make it easier to see. The food is about halfway full and I'm going to pour the oil on top. You'll notice as I pour through, gravity wants to pull that oil down, but it rises to the top again because it's less dense. Quite simply, the oil has less substance and less mass packed inside of every molecule, so it's much lighter and floats to the top. However much we tried to mix these liquids up, they would end up separating back out into the two layers. To add in an extra bit of fun, we're going to drop in an effervescence tablet. 
this tablet is a sterilizing tablet that you use for dentures but you could use the vitamin c tablets or you could use alka-seltzers anything that creates a fizz i'm going to drop it into the bottom of the glass it's going to travel through the oil and hit the water this tablet's going to dissolve in the water and as it dissolves there are chemicals inside of it that start reacting and make a gas this chemical reaction means that the gas travels up through the liquid through the oil until it gets released at the top However hard we try, oil and water just won't mix together on their own. In fact, the oil molecules pretty much repel the water. We would say it's almost scared of water. And that has a term called hydrophobic. Hydro meaning water, phobic meaning scared of. The oil is scared of the water. It is hydrophobic. Now, if we did want the oil and the water to mix together, we'd have to use another liquid that was able to make the bonds stick. Imagine if we were to look really closely at the oil and water molecules. We'd find that the ends of the molecules just repel each other and something else will have to bond between them. In this case, we're going to use soap and soap acts like a surfactant or an emulsifier to combine the two things together. If I try and mix the oil and water alone, we see that they'll end up separating very quickly until we put the soap in. And as soon as we add soap, it starts to allow the oil and water to mix together, making bonds between the two different types of molecules. This time, if we leave the liquid to settle, it's not going to form those individual layers. And that's because the soap has emulsified it. The soap molecules are grabbing hold of an oil molecule and a water molecule and pulling them in together. And this is why soap and detergents are really good at taking the oils off our hands when we need to wash them. And Oil's not the only substance that doesn't like water and is hydrophobic. In fact, we can find lots of other substances in our house. We're going to use these today to create some scientific art. So here I've got some wax crayons and some watercolours. I'm going to draw a picture with my wax crayons on a piece of paper and use the watercolours as the background for my scenery. I've drawn a space picture of a rocket blasting off towards the sun. And everywhere that I don't want coloured in with the black watercolour that I'm going to use as my background for space, I've had to colour in with wax crayons. So everything, including the white parts that I want to stay white, have been covered in wax. If we now apply the watercolour, we can literally go over the whole of the picture and brush over so that the, all the background is covered in. As I brush onto the paper, we can see that the paper is absorbing the watercolour, but everywhere I'm brushing over any wax crayon, it's repelling. So I've painted over my picture in the watercolour paint very quickly, but you can take much more time over your picture. And you can see how the water droplets are behaving over the top of the wax. The wax is protecting the paper and stopping the watercolours from absorbing. And that's all because it's hydrophobic. 
another hydrophobic substance is shaving foam. Shaving foam provides a layer or a barrier on top of the skin whilst a razor is being used. And it doesn't absorb into the skin like water does. We're going to use this to create another form of scientific art. So I'm going to take a tray and squirt some shaving foam into a layer across the base of the tray. Remember, shaving foam will expand because there's lots of air trapped inside as it fills up the tray. On top of the shaving foam, we're going to put a few drops of water-based ink. If you don't have any ink, you can use water-based paints and just water it down with a little bit more water, or we could use food colouring. I'm going to take a few drops of the ink and add it onto the surface of the shaving foam. And then I'm going to swirl and make a pattern. So I don't want to mix it all in so that it becomes one colour. I want to create a nice swirling pattern effect. Something like this. Now I'm going to take a piece of paper and our paper is going to get gently pressed on top of the shaving foam. And what we should find is that the paper is now going to absorb the ink or water-based paints that you've used, but leave behind the shaving foam. As I take off the paper, some of the shaving foam will stay on, but it won't be absorbed into the paper. So I'm going to scrape off the extra shaving foam. And it should leave behind our swirly pattern. Now what's nice is you can repeat this experiment because not all the shaving foam has mixed in and it's not all blended in yet. So we can keep swirling or adding a bit more ink or paint to create new patterns. Whether you're using food colouring or paints, you can get an even better effect if you use more than one colour and create a really cool marbling ink effect. The density of an object can play an interesting role in its ability to float or buoyancy. In this example, we're going to use an orange and an unpeeled orange. If I take an orange and drop it into the water, we can see it floats. But if I take the unpeeled orange and drop it into the water, it sinks to the bottom. This is very strange, considering that if we peel an orange, we're taking mass away, it's getting lighter. This is all to do with the density of the skin. The orange peel is a very porous material and it traps lots of air bubbles inside of it. Air is less dense than water, so with enough air trapped inside of the skin, it allows the whole orange to float to the surface. But when you take the skin away, the whole object becomes more dense because there's no air trapped inside and it sinks to the bottom. Interestingly, it's not just solid substances that can dissolve in liquids. In fact, if it wasn't for oxygen being dissolved in our water, such as oceans and rivers and lakes, then the sea animals would suffocate. They need the oxygen present in the water in order to survive. Fizzy drinks are a great example of how gases can get dissolved in liquids. And here we have a fizzy drink machine. This machine has a gas canister filled with carbon dioxide and it pushes the gas inside of the water, creating a solution where the gas is dissolved inside. There we go. The gas can only be forced inside of the liquid with enough pressure. And that's why our fizzy drink containers always feel really hard and tight and are difficult to squeeze because there's a massive amount of pressure exerting on the container. 
the moment that you undo the lid or you pull the ring cap back, the pressure is released and allows the gas to escape from the liquid. We're going to use this fizzy water in an experiment. With a glass of fizzy water, we're going to drop different objects inside and see what happens. Is it going to sink? Is it going to float? Or is it going to bounce around? You can make a prediction with every object you add. I'm going to start with a few raisins. If we drop the raisins inside, hang on a minute. They sink to start with and then they rise up. That's quite unusual. As we drop a raisin into the liquid, this raisin sinks to the bottom. That's because it's more dense than the water it's traveling through. But we can see air bubbles surrounding each of the raisins. This experiment doesn't just work with raisins, in fact you can try lots of other ingredients in your kitchen cupboards. Things such as silver balls that were used to decorate our cakes, or even popcorn kernels or sprinkles or rice. You can explore with each of these different items at home, but before you drop something in, do have a guess and make a prediction what you think is going to happen. Is it going to sink? Is it going to float? Will it dissolve? Are the gas bubbles going to make it light enough to rise to the top? Lots of substances have chemicals that naturally want to form orderly patterns and line up. And you can see this in examples of crystals. Let's have a go at making some crystals. In order to form a crystal, we need to make a super saturated liquid. Here we have a cup of hot water. It's not boiling, but it is hand hot. So do be careful and have an adult on standby if you need them. With hot water rather than cold water, we can dissolve more of a substance. And this is because it has more energy to break apart the substance and join in with the water. Whereas cold water has less energy. You can choose what substance to dissolve in your water. Salt, sugar, Epsom salts work really well. We're going to use Epsom salts today. I'm going to pour in a few of the Epsom salts and I'm going to stir it until it looks really dissolved and then I'm going to add a little bit more. I'm going to keep adding and keep mixing until no more will dissolve. This might take a couple of minutes of stirring and adding slowly more and more of your substance. When you can see that no more substance is going to dissolve inside, then that's when we know we've got a super saturated liquid. Well, we can take this liquid and get it to evaporate and as it evaporates it's going to leave behind crystals. Now I could leave it in a cup like this but to form crystals faster we need a larger surface area. So if I take a tray and pour my liquid onto the tray we've now got a large surface area in which evaporation can occur. So if I leave this on a windowsill, the sun can shine through the window onto the surface of our solution and allow the water to evaporate away. As it evaporates, it's going to leave behind some crystals. After a few days in the sunshine, lots of water has evaporated and started to leave behind some crystals. If we look at these crystals in close detail, we can see how the chemicals are starting to line up in a neat and ordinary design. These Epsom salts are lining up to create a parallelogram shape, sort of a squished rectangle. If we want to make larger crystals, we need to leave our saturated solution to evaporate slowly. If we've 
had a go at this first experiment, we can then take a crystal and use it as a seed crystal to make more. I've made a second super saturated solution of Epsom salts. So I've dissolved lots of salts into my water and then I've left the water to cool. And this is important. I'm then going to take a seed crystal and thread it onto a piece of cotton. So I've tied the cotton around the seed crystal and I'm now going to dangle that into the super saturated solution. Because this liquid had time to cool, it shouldn't dissolve our seed crystal. When we put the seed crystal inside, there's now something to attract the rest of the crystals to start forming. So as more liquid evaporates, we should find that our seed crystal grows larger. Epsom salts create a really interesting crystallised form, but different substances will have different shapes. Why not try a super saturated solution of sugar and see what shape the sugar crystals form?